Live from Balgala, this is Paul Murray Live, Our Town. G'day, Balgala! How are we all? Now, we have been very lucky enough to travel the entire country. We are here in Balgala. Now, I may get shot at, at any moment here if I misplace the exact location of where we are, but we're at the good end of the Northern Beach. Is that better? There we go, yes. The good end of the Northern Beach is here in Sydney. Uh, we are looking forward to a great conversation with wonderful people because the joy of many of our big cities is that it's sort of cities within cities, towns within towns, and that's going to be one of our themes tonight. We've got some... Great guests coming up. You're going to see me just perfect the art of lawn bowling. I won't lie. Like, I can retire tomorrow. That's how good it was. Um, also, uh, if you want to see the exact opposite end of things, is my bad behaviour when it comes to golf. Um, and I wasn't acting when I threw the club. But anyway, you'll see all of this in a moment or two's time. But first, let's get into the news of the day because there's plenty of it around, including um, Tasmania, I feel for you. I really do, because that is a cluster of a result that's come out of its state election. As always, when there are big elections, we always tell you the five things that you need to know. So here's the five things that I think are worth noting out of what happened in Tasmania. Now, of course, the whole idea was that uh, will the last remaining Liberal government uh, stay or go? Tonight, they are likely to stay, but it is not going to be an easy path for them to do so. Because, put simply, you need 18 seats to form a majority. Right now, tonight, the Liberals have just 13 seats. However, there are a chance of gaining another five. Labor are at 10 seats and therefore are behind on the overall seat count right now, but they could go up by another two. The Greens have got four but could go up by one more. And the Lambie Network, well, it could be as little as two, it could be as much as four, but I'll talk about their power in a moment or two's time. Now, interesting to note here that we've used the official electoral information about the 13, 10, 4, 2 and 2. The prediction model is the Anthony Green model that still exists on the ABC's website. So considering we pay for it, I might use it anyway, which is uh, maybe as, as high as 18. That would, of course, be the outright majority. Likelihood of getting to that? Unlikely. So let's imagine we cut that in half. You end up with sort of 15, 16, maybe, which means they do have to go shopping for support to be able to remain as a government. Now, remember, the whole purpose of this election was because the government that won a majority at the last election slowly had it eaten away by people who became independents and independents who ultimately were no longer willing to support the government. So rather than that being a process that plays out over three years, it basically is the exact position that starts whatever government is cobbled together. Here is the Premier of Tasmania reflecting on his choices already reached out to uh, independents, uh, potential independents and indeed uh, the Lambie party as well. And uh, look forward to uh, those ongoing uh, discussions. For their part, the Labor Party say that it is unlikely they're going to be able to form a government. But before we write that off, even though the fact that, of course, they have fewer seats, once you start to put together the coalition of anyone but the Libs, there would be a way, there would be a very rickety way, but still, power is power, for them to be able to form a government. So, while last night they were talking about uh, the fight going on, and today they're trying to put themselves into the back seat, spare that as the grain of salt about how they're spinning the result, uh, on the outcome of the results yesterday, it seems that it's very unlikely that Labor can form government. And on the basis that the Liberal Party have one more seat and convention would dictate that the Governor would ask the Premier uh, to form government, whether it's in the Parliament or um, with the support of the crossbench, uh, that is the likely outcome of this election result. See, so she's a piece of work, the Labor leader, and I'll get to that why, but nothing has changed today from last night. She could have made those statements last night, but chose not to because she didn't want to concede. She didn't want to go through the act of losing, which in actual fact is where the numbers were. Anyway, uh, second point, the Liberal vote tanked, and I mean tanked. It was uh, the lowest point they've been for a long time, and it's the lowest point the Labor Party has been in the best part of 100 years as well. So again, the anyone but Team Red, Team Blue, well, is often the story of Australian politics. It's certainly playing out in Tasmania, and Tasmania gives us a bit of a preview of where we may go into the next federal election. You can see the best part of 12 points off the Liberal Party, yet still they end up winning 
more seats. That's because of the system that they have, um, which works a little more like the New Zealand system. It's called the Hare Clark system. It's not one person per electorate. It's seven people per electorate. And uh, if you have slightly bigger share than anyone else, you end up with more people. Uh, Labor, ever so slightly up, but again, their worst performance in the best part of a century. The Greens, ever so slightly up. Where did it all go? Well, local independents, including the bloke who used to be the leader of the Labor Party, who was able to uh, run as an independent, get himself re-elected, and of course the Jackie Lambie network. Now, the third thing, which brings me back to what I was sort of saying before. Rebecca White is a three-time loser. Dump, go, go away. Third time loser. Now, she is only in her early 40s, but she has spent the vast bulk of her time in Tasmanian politics as the opposition leader. Now, she lost in 2021. She lost in 2018. She lost last night. So the people of Tasmania, if nothing else, have said that they don't want this person to be their Premier. Now, I don't know what she's like personally. I'm sure she's lovely, loves her family and friends. But in terms of as a political leader, getting two shots at it is pretty amazing. <laughs> getting three is impossible. Getting fourth, unless you own the party, hell no, not going to happen. That said, she's right now literally between hero and zero because if she cobbles it together, she could be the Premier, but for how long? But that's rather unlikely. So the most likely outcome at this sec uh, second is that the... Labor Party would, of course, be pointing at whatever coalition is put together in Tasmania, but uh, it will need a new leader. And a perfect example of that is, as I mentioned, David O'Byrne. Now, after Rebecca White lost not one but two elections, they decided to move on from a two-time election loser. Now, David Byrne then became the leader and then internal squabbles, which resulted in Rebecca White returning to be the leader, meant that he was pushed out of the party. But he knew that there were people who wanted to support him as at least a politician, so he was able to get himself elected last night as an independent. Now, interestingly about his politics, obviously, Labor leader, but he may well end up being one of the key numbers that helps the Liberal Party get into power. His position on the stadium is, we should have the stadium, we should have the footy team, and he disagrees with many of the things that the modern Labor Party has come to stand for. So imagine the idea of the former opposition leader propping up the current Premier. That's how weird this election was in Tasmania. And then the fourth, which makes it particularly unique, Jackie Lambie and the fact that in and around the crazy cat lady from Tasmania. Uh, again, I'm sure she's lovely. Uh, but the reality is, is that her candidates literally went door to door and, as I showed you the other night, but for those who may have missed it because, of course, footy and other things on, can you believe that the Lambie candidates actually admitted on television, no policies, literally no policies. No idea, no policies, they just were going to be there for the vibe. Now, many independents have been able to do that, <coughs> teals, but the thing is that when it comes to the Lambie network, again, she's a politician in Canberra, and then these people that may well be elected in her name end up having all of the power in the Tasmanian parliament. But, again, here are the candidates running for parliament admitting they have no ideas. Definitely with the Lambia Network, it's all about values. So we haven't already got pre-decided policies or you know, specific areas. And that's, to me, that's true democracy. Here we are representing the people. It, true democracy? Vote for me and we'll work it out later? Now, I get it. There are people who cannot stand Team Red, Team Blue politics. I mean, at the federal level, where we're sitting right now, it is a teal electorate. But the reality is, is that anyone who puts themselves up for office, Team Red, Team Blue, Team Green, Team, team Orange, whatever colour they haven't run on yet, if they don't tell you up front what you can expect, then would you hire them for the job? Well, in the case of this scenario, yes, that is exactly what happened, and they could be in a position, along with the former opposition leader, to decide whether the Liberals remain as the government. But Jackie Lambie is intensely personal. Imagine sitting and negotiating with her. Now, she is hating on the existing Liberal government, not based on any of their policies, but because they campaigned against the Lambie network, which apparently is a sin. I think that Jackie Lambie tried to look for um, Jeremy Rockcliffe to extend the hand of friendship out yesterday, and he didn't bother to do that once again. So that's his second chance in three days. Uh, my candidates are watching all this play out, which is not very helpful to Jeremy Rockcliffe. I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what, they have not played this game very well. It's, 
It's just because we, we're basing ourselves on integrity and transparency and doing the right thing uh, and leading by example. And I'll tell you what, what we've seen out of the Liberal Party has been absolutely shocking. It's been disgraceful. It is really, really, I mean, it's up to my candidates, mate, but seriously, uh, they're sitting here going, yeah, this is going to be really, really difficult. Oh, dear God. Um, now, again, I understand when people are good local advocates and I understand when it comes to things like veterans affairs, you know, broken clock can be right twice a day. But the idea that, oh, we won't make you the government because you're not good at the game, it's not a game. It's running of your state. It's the running of your health system. It's the running of your police. It's the running of your schools. It's housing policy. Now, if Jackie Lambie thinks that the existing government has not delivered enough, then OK, try and go and give the power to somebody else. But that's got to be the reason. Not because they campaigned against you in an election when you campaigned against them. It's contested office. So you would think that the smoke would clear, but it hasn't. But believe it or not, the lady who is not running in the parliament, but the candidates are running in her name. The candidates who were running in her name that didn't have any policies, who is now turning around and saying they may not even try to pick a government because they deserve three years training as MPs. Roll the tape. Uh, maybe they, that three may get the chance to sit on the sidelines and everybody else can make, go and make the deals and the parties up uh, and we'll just sit there and learn the job, maybe. You know, that's, that's another option that we have and just stay out of the rubble. Seriously. My mum's here tonight, so I can't swear, but there's, a, <laughs> there's some things that roll through my head about that as an approach to things. Honestly. And number five, the good news. No more Hamburglar. Now, for those that are long-term viewers of the show, here is the Easter egg for you. A lady's called Sue Hickey. Now, Sue Hickey was the lady who was the mayor of Hobart, then became a Liberal MP. Then, when they wouldn't make her a minister, she cracked the Harry hits and got together with Labor and the Greens to become the Speaker. Why is she called the Hamburglar? Because of what she was wearing on the very day of which she decided to steal, essentially, the position of Speaker. We're not going to show it. Oh, come on, we should. It's got the black and white stripes. Anyway, sadly, she finished ninth uh, with just 2,943 <laughs> amazing votes. So sorry, Hamburglar, that you didn't get there. I really am. Anyway, we'll turn our attention to Grimace. But before we get there, let's talk about the former South Australian Premier Stephen Marshmallow. Now, remember the Marshmallow, because he was by name, was by nature. He's the one who trusted that Chief Health Officer who said, don't touch the ball because it's been touched by sweaty men. And if it's been touched by sweaty men, then you could get coronavirus. And coronavirus is worse than anything, and it will kill everybody. So don't touch it. Anyway, uh, he was also the idiot who decided to get rid of uh, supercars from South Australia. So I was more than happy to... Uh, Death ride his candidacy. Well, he's gone, but after a couple of well, about a year and a bit, he's now uh, had a by election. He had a by election uh, yesterday in his seat where the Liberal Party vote was down 6%, the Greens vote was up 3%. Why am I telling you anything about a South Australian by election about a politician that you had forgot had even existed? Yes, that was your legacy, Marshmallow. Well, it's because uh, my mate Philip Curry, who you know that I rely upon very heavily for some insight that he writes publicly about politics, and he says that what is happening in South Australia, if that vote moved across, say, within 12 months to the federal election, the Greens were a little bit further up, the independents were a little bit further up, then it could potentially mean that the seat of Sturt, which is currently held by the Liberal Party, used to be held by Christopher Pine, well, it would end up going green. If that's the case, then, obviously, the Liberal Party robbed of one number. Now, I've told you many times before that the math of the next little while is because of the Teals, the Liberal Party probably can't get to 76, which means it's about the government staying over 76. If they go under 76, which they probably will, due to some seats lost in Western Australia, some independents that are going to move around like a Dai Li in Western Sydney and a couple of other places, it means they're a minority. If they're a minority, then they have to go shopping, just like Jeremy Rockcliffe is going to do. And the suggestion from Philip Curry is that unless the Libs can lift a little bit in South Australia, well, then it makes things a little bit easier, of maybe outright majority, for uh, the current Prime Minister, the greatest Prime Minister of all time. Now, let's talk about uh, Princess Kate. Let's talk about the Princess of Wales. Now, as you know, uh, she revealed this weekend uh, that she has cancer. She's also, uh, yet again, asked for privacy and some of the stuff that's been written and said about her in the past few weeks is obviously disgraceful. I mean, I said it on the Sunday showdown last week. She's obviously sick, right? She's always been sick. 
what she's exactly sick with? Well, we don't know. And there's a conversation about whether we should or shouldn't or how much or how little, but that's for them to decide. But as it stands right now, we get public statements like this. This, of course, came as a huge shock. And William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. She's gorgeous and obviously, yes, she's a volunteer to the whole royal family, but nobody wants her family to have to go through the double worry of the world having to sit back and decide what's wrong with her and I thought it was beautiful the way that she said what she said. And I'm also pleased there are some people in the media who came forward and said, you know what, I did the wrong thing in wildly speculating about what's wrong here and well done to Kerry Sackville who wrote today in uh, the Sydney Morning Herald that she was part of it, she was more than happy to talk about, oh, is it this, is it that and all the rest of it, but she owned up to that as a personal failing and I've got to say, while we disagree on politics and all the rest of it, I like when anyone turns around and says, you know what, I got it wrong and in part that's what she's said here. But this gets me to the part that I just want to offer a suggestion. And I say this with all the love in the world because I don't want this lady to be sick, I don't want her kids to be worried, and I don't want the world to have to go through the trauma, especially those that have faced cancer or are facing cancer of, of being, for want of a better term, triggered by everything that's happening right now. But we have an issue. And the issue is that we have the royal family in some ways trying to be incredibly modern, be very forward-leaning, having videos about their private life or showing documentaries. It's not the palace of the 1820s when occasionally they'll wave at somebody from out of the balcony. The reality is, is that transparency is kind of part of what we expect now. But let me walk you through this. Now, as you know, uh, King Charles has cancer. What type of cancer? What's the prognosis? We don't know. Why does it matter? For obvious reasons, he, of course, is the king of, among other places, Australia and... Should he pass, whenever he passes, fingers crossed in decades to come, of course, it steps down to his son, being William. But, of course, for him to become king, Queen, the great Queen Elizabeth II had to pass away. And do you know what was written on the death certificate of the Queen? Old age. That was it. Now, we don't live in an era anymore where people die of old age. They end up dying of something else. Now, none of us want to die, none of us want to get sick, no part of me wants to be ghoulish about this conversation. But in the same way that we should know what's going on with the king, we should know what's going on with everyone who's in the real line of succession, about who would be their replacements. In this case, I would suggest as well with Catherine because she ends up being the queen. And there's a model for this. In the United States, they do a yearly physical of the president. Now, yes, the current one is dead, but still. The... <laughs> Theoretically, they do a medical test of the president. And I was having a look at this today, and it's literally 24 pages long. And it shows you what they're being treated with, what medication they're being treated with, what might happen into the future. It is a very detailed document. Now, again, missing from the current one is anything about the scarecrow's brain. But the point is, I think this is where maybe the royal family have to start thinking about this as an option into the future. Now, whether it starts with the king and it's only for the king, OK. Whether it's for the king and the immediate heir, maybe. Because there's so much symbolism in and around the throne that one of the worst things that people who don't like it as an organisation is that they use speculation to undermine it. Hence why, when we were having a conversation about the Princess of Wales, who was quite crook, we were talking about marriages and body weight and all of this other crap that has nothing to do with it because at some point when she becomes the Queen there's a certain section of people that have been worked over that there's nothing special about the role that she takes. So just a suggestion and for the record when I made this suggestion to my mum earlier she said no leave them alone but still I just think let's follow the American model let's try to get detailed proper information don't do it for kids but let's do it for people so we know where we are. Now Let's celebrate the wonderful place that is Balgala. Now, Balgala Bowls Club is one of those magnificent local clubs. And I love a local club because it was set up by the people that we love that aren't here anymore. 
And in the same way that we say we want to live a life for them, well, let's go and do the recreational things that they did. And that's certainly what I did at Balgala Bowling Club this week. By now you know how much I love clubs. Big ones, little ones, city ones, bush ones. Ones with a big future and one with no future. And I'll tell you why. It's because I grew up knowing that my grandfather started his local RSL club. When I was born, my father was a greenkeeper at a bowling club. And I've always understood that your local club represents the history of your area. And I always like to connect to those histories, but also want to be part of its future. It's no different in Balgala and at the bowling club here, you can see on every single wall a name that is a person, that is a story, that is a volunteer. Even though he's a Kiwi, Tony Wagner loves this place more than almost anyone else. He has put his heart and soul into not just keeping it as a great place to play bowls, but a wonderful place to sit back and enjoy a meal and a beer at the valley. G'day, Tony. How are you? Hey, Paul. How are you? I love this joint, and I'll tell you why. Um, I love that you have kept so much history here. I love that every name on the wall of a life member, a club champion, is somebody who has their own story to tell. I love that there's somebody who volunteered for this bar. I love the details that are just the heart of the community. There's a beautiful history here, and it's a history of volunteers and members who have contributed, you know? The carpet could tell a, a million stories, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the bar is, you know, how could you change this? Now for the main event, Graham Lucas, a man who is well known around these parts as an absolute ace on the green, a man with a killer moustache and the stories to prove it, a man who knows how the ball rolls and is willing to teach me how to get it as close to the jack as humanly possible. Oh, look at that. First thing we have to talk about is the grip of the bowl. Mm -hmm. So we put our four fingers, yes, great one. All right, here we go. Four fingers around there. Yep. Okay. Thumb there. And a gap. Oh, yeah, okay. Don't put it right into the palm. Yes. That's bad news. It should be firm, but not over tight. Right. And not too loose, of course. You hold it right like that. If it falls out, it's too big. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, you're aiming for that red pole. And I'm aiming for that red pole, okay. That's not bad. That's quite good. And when you leave the green, you can come in here. It's a brand new room, but it's still got plenty of old school history. Darts, pool, and the rest of my day is done. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you to everyone at Bagel Bowler. Honestly, support your local club and that one in particular. Two people who know it very well is Natalie Ward and uh, James Griffin. James is the uh, lower house member in this part of the world and the upper house member, of course, is, uh, is Nat. Lovely to see you both. Thank you very yeah. much for being here. Great to be here. Um, again, part of why we wanted to do this show this way in particular here is that, as you know, there's communities within communities, right? And when you are somebody who could be you're representing Manly, there'll be people in the room who say Balgala's not Manly and Manly people say Manly's not Balgala. How do you traverse that? How do you get around that? Because you want to be not all things to all people, but you don't want to say this bit's better than the other bit. I know, you've got to love them all, all equally. Um, and the name of the seat, Manly, is sort of a bit of a misnomer because you do have beautiful suburbs and communities like where we are today, which is Balgala. Um, so, it, but it's kind of got everything that Manly has, but the added bonus of not the crowds. Yes, exactly, exactly. But also, Nat, it's that thing where, with the, the, the bowling club you were saying before that you literally you lived near it for a while, but it's like it is a beautiful little place to celebrate community, and it's one that I'm sure you've attended four trillion functions at, but it is a special little joint, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely cracking. Uh, we used to live across the road. We took our kids there. We had birthday parties there. Uh, it is just the most beautiful place where you can raise your family, 
You can ride their bikes outside and you can still ride your bikes on the streets. Yes. Uh, and it's just absolutely spectacular that you can have older people, kids riding around, and that's exactly what a good family suburb should be. You know, I want to ask you both about politics in an area where there could be people that are deeply invested and people who, you know, what's happening at the surf, right? And that's fine. That's all the way people's lives work. Um, when... How, how do you traverse that? Because obviously there'll be people who want to get right up in the detail of something and there's nothing you can say that's going to be OK to flip them. Conversely, you've got to make some people care. How do you do it? I think people uh, expect you to stand for something. Uh, for me, it's standing for family values. That's where we're, That's who I am. That's where we're from. Uh, but also, I, you know, I think they respect having a difference of opinion, but ultimately you've got to stand up for what you believe in. Mm. And that's why you get elected or you don't. Yep. And they might disagree with you completely, and that's fine, but they want to have a good, robust argument. Other people just want you to get out of their lives. Yes. They don't want government in their lives. Leave us alone to raise our kids and go to the beach and get out of our lives. But when they do care about something and you listen, uh, that's what they really want out of someone that's elected. Yeah, you know, they want just just listen to us. Yeah, it's the same thing for you, James. Because because again, there are very passionate people who want something that might not be the issue of the day, and they've got every right to bring it up. And you've got to try and go and argue on their behalf. But how how do you handle those two extremes? Because they exist mm -hmm. in every electorate, but particularly here. Yeah, I mean, this community it's a hard marker uh, as an electorate. They're smart, they're intelligent, uh, passionate about where we live and 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 what's on offer here. It had 16 years of an independent state MP, um, but we've you know, fought that back now three elections in a row, um, and I'm proud to be a Liberal MP representing this beautiful community. And I think it's because they respect hard work. Yeah. Um, they want you to get out there and make sure that the services are delivered in this community are as good as they can be, but also they're a very generous people, and so they want to make sure that uh, if they've got the opportunity to contribute and help, um, right across the state with things that we've got in this community, like Bear Cottage, for example. Yes. They will dig deep and they will help their community. Bloody hell. Thank you very much, guys. Do appreciate it. Thank you, James. Thank you, Nat. Uh, now, after the break, plenty more to fire up about here in that beautiful Balgala, where you're going to uh, meet a person that, look, I don't want to put too much pressure on her, but gold medal, gold medal, gold medal may well be what's on her way when it comes to Paris. And, yes, I play golf very badly at the local club. More in a sec here from Balgala. We're live at the Totem Club, which is a magnificent local facility as well. Back in your local club, you are all. Welcome back to Balgala. Now, we've got some special people for you to meet, uh, including somebody who has got an incredible series of achievements behind her, but what is in front of her is going to be amazing. I've got to say, the good people of Harvey Norman are the reason we have been able to do Our Town for as long as we have. Their brand new store, uh, well, it's been around for a long time, but the new version of the store that exists here in Balgala is the best I've seen in the country. If you ever have the opportunity uh, to get down, have a look, please do so. It's worth the travel across town or if you're in town to check it out as well. Now, again, Harvey Norman is the reason why we've been able to travel the country and why we're in this specific region because we've got a special person to meet and it's a person who is going to win gold for Australia, no pressure, uh, at the Paris Paralympic Games. Winning an Olympic gold medal, it's not the tangible medal that you're most proud of, it's the lead up and the the sacrifice and the choices and the process to get to that point. I mean, when I won in Tokyo, I was almost 21, but um, I'd say I'd been swimming since I was seven years old. Every day that we train, everything we do is geared towards the Paralympic Games. It's the pinnacle of our sport. I wake up at 4.20 in the morning and I have my breakfast, then I'll get driven down to training to start at 5am. I train from 5am to 7am. Especially right now since I'm year 11. Oh my goodness, you know, that's, that's intense. I was going through so many moments there, I just thought, was it, is it worth it? Like my body obviously just can't take it. Um, so getting through those tough times was extremely difficult. 
From childhood dreams to a world stage at the Olympics and Paralympics, representing Australia, they weren't born to be athletes. It took hard work and a life of sacrifice. But even these heroes don't get there alone. Behind their amazing athletic performances are an incredible team of coaches, schools, communities, and of course, very proud parents. They're already under enormous pressure when either they're on the field or they're training from uh, all of the uh, external pressures that they're under. Now, what you've got to be very careful of is that at home, you need to be a parent. Jeff came to us and said, I want to be there, I want to be in the Olympics. I said, mate, they're only taking one from Australia. He said, it's going to be me. It never stops. <laughs> never stops. Even when she sleeps, she's still swimming. You can't get there on your own. To be the best, you have to surround yourself with the best. And that's why our mates at Harvey Norman have made sure that they are the best. Here at the newly refurbished Harvey Norman in Balgala, they have everything you could possibly want in tech and electronics. So the marathon was like a push all the way through the line. Like You don't have to be an athlete at the top of their game, like Paralympic champion Madison D. Rosario. You can also be a TV host. G'day, Madison. Thank you very much for the chat. Of course. All right. Now, uh, you're obviously somebody who uh, is a high-performance athlete but obviously wants to make the most of the technology that's around. How does it help? in sport and yeah. everywhere across the board. I think we're seeing so much progression in sport and so much of it is now becoming very tech based. There's so much more that we can do and use than I think we ever used to. What about nutrition? What are some of your, uh, your go-tos? Fueling an enormous training load and, and so I think, you know, when it comes to, to that, it's that kind of, you need that planning, which is what I'm bad at. So I find having like a functional kitchen that I need in is the one thing that makes it so much easier. Now, a little bit you told me that, uh, well, an air fryer might be what you need <laughs> in your life. Now, I'm, I'm intrigued in this as a performance, okay. uh, as, as a performance tool, because as a man who likes uh, the old oil fry, are you saying the difference between me and becoming a medalist could be an air fryer? I think we're going to have to find out. I think you're up for an air fryer too and then report back. <laughs> Madison is all types of awesome. She is at her best. Madison Rosario adds gold in the eight. Our mates at Harvey Norman are at their best and everyone is looking forward to a magnificent year of memories. In Paris, 2024. I'm pleased to say Madison's here, along with uh, Kate McLaughlin, who is from the, uh, who's the chef de Michon for our Paralympic team. Lovely to see you both. Always great watching yourself back on telly, isn't it? Bizarre every time. It's always great. Go, That's great. Well, and, and when we were at the store the other day, they've got on loop your achievements. <sighs> are you the type of person who loves watching it, got a photo of everything, got a medal everywhere, or you've just got all the trophies under the bed? No, I think you know this from, you saw my face, when you turned that corner <laughs> and all the screens had the 800 from Tokyo on it. No, I, I haven't really watched that race back uh, since Tokyo, so not particularly. Well, you saw it on every possible screen at Harvey Norman and Valdella. Yes. Kate, give us an idea about some of the impediments that exist for people who uh, may well have all of the focus, like every other athlete, but they just don't connect into Paralympic programs. Yeah, it's really tricky. There are so many different barriers for people to get into sport um, if you have a disability. And it's certainly something we're identifying now, you know, lack of coaching staff, um, people understanding Paralympic sport, venues. The equipment's very expensive as well. You know, look at the chair that, that Maddie races in. Ridiculously expensive, isn't it? So there's lots of barriers, but it's something we need to focus on to make sure that we can increase the number of people. How do you handle sport? pressure? Because one of the things about the Paralympic team is that it's been so wildly successful over the years, right? And the assumption is, lazily amongst Australians, oh, yeah, we'll, you know, quadruple the Olympic count, that's what's going to happen at the Paralympics, but for obvious reasons, uh, effort required. How do you handle that pressure of expectation, that when you've been successful, you look like somebody who uh, is on track for good performance, 
Do you put it out of your mind? How do you deal with that expectation? I do think it needs to be almost entirely intrinsic. I think there is so much external pressure to, to perform a certain way and be a certain kind of athlete. And, and the reality is, I think if you turn up thinking you're able to do that, you're almost setting yourself up for disaster. I think it's almost arrogant. Um, when I line up on the start line at, at a Paralympic Games, I'm lining up next to you know 15 other women who are just as good as I am. And I've been an underdog before and so I know what it feels like to, to win a race no one expects of you and I would never discount any athlete on that line to the same thing and I think that you turn up every race exists in a vacuum you race the race in front of you and that's what you can do so forgive me getting you to repeat a story but I've got to ask right which is when you are in a 40 kilometer race um what starts to hurt at what point in 40 k's yeah, so for, for myself, it's the position of the race chair that becomes the most painful. I think you're, it's, it's such an awkward position. We saw it on the screen just now. You're, you're, you're really down. You're cramped in, a, in, in something that you wouldn't normally find yourself in. And so I find that my stabilising muscles, like my ability to stay in that position from a really strong perspective, gives out more than my active movement muscles. We train them so well, and, and that's the key focus. But you kind of... There's so much more that, that goes into it. And but when we're watching you at 30 k's, mm -hmm. like obviously everything, mm -hmm. but your back, your shoulder, your neck, what is just killing? <laughs> My soul, man. <laughs> like it's yeah. Yeah. that point of the race. It's it's purely it's mental at that point. I think physically, you know, you're gonna hit a wall. You know, it's gonna it's gonna hurt. You're gonna you know be giving everything and having nothing left to give, but still having to find something every single time. And and that never goes away. And I think what divides a Paralympic field in that final isn't who's physically the most prepared because we're all exactly as prepared as each other. It's how you turn up, you know, at that 37 kilometer mark. How do you get That's to those last five kilometers? Look, as a prime athlete, I feel that every day. <laughs> uh, I understand. Uh, now, it was okay. Give us an idea about what it's like to work with these athletes because amazing people, but also high demand, high performance. What's it like? Oh, I pinch myself every day. They're amazing um, to, to see them compete. And often you have really tricky weeks. In the lead up to a game, you've got 156 days to go. It's busy. But to go to a training session or to see an athlete compete and qualify, that's what reminds you why you do what you do. Uh, to see them on the world stage representing our country so brilliantly, it's pretty special. Val Gallagher, give them a round of applause. Go kick off. <laughs> do your best in Paris. Thank you, guys. You're doing so proud. Really do appreciate it. Thanks again to our good uh, mates at Harvey Norman for supporting that team. Quick break, back with more, plenty to do, plenty to talk about. Yep, we're going to play some golf. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching us here. Of course, the very good people of uh, Valgala are our focus for our town tonight. The Royal Report will be uh, much more detail about the Princess of Wales in a few minutes' time at the top of the hour. But two people I really want you to meet here that are uh, great locals that have done incredible things. Now, Christina Rivers uh, has already... Uh, absolutely blown me away. She's intimidating me with her awesomeness already, and I mean that in the best possible way. She cycled across Australia, OK? Uh, she rode 3,970 uh, kilometres in 11 days to get a Guinness World Record. That, of course, was Perth to Balgala, OK? David Price uh, is an award-winning uh, member of the Northern Beaches uh, Council. He got the Outstanding Community Service Award for his contribution to, to life serving in the area. He's been active since 2008 and he's been volunteering for a long period of time, especially with uh, the emergency operations around here. All right, bios, <laughs> done. Let's get to meet some people here. All right. Um, Christina. Yes. How far into the ride from that side of the country to this side of the country do you go, what am I doing? First time or second time? I'm going to pick the first time, <laughs> the first quarter of the first time, maybe. Yes. But what made you go back and do it? Well, I didn't succeed the first time. Look at you. Just, I like this. All right. Now, also, how important is it for you to, the, the people watching us right now, that the challenge may not be something as substantive as that, but you want people to be able to do something with the days that we all have. Don't just sit around and, you know... Well, that's it. Watch movies. You can watch TV, especially what you're watching right now, but you get my point. That's it. That's it. And that's part of it. I have two young daughters. Uh, that first time being unsuccessful, there was a lot out of control. There was elements. I had knee injuries. There's unprecedented headwinds, road trains. I could hardly keep my head up. Um, and I had to abandon 2,500 kilometres across the country. Wow. Mm. Where did you put... Where about, where, how far... Port Augusta. Augusta. Port Augusta, and that's it, I'm done. Well, 
as I said, the headwinds, there was rainstorms, and I wasn't going to meet the target. Two small children, two businesses, I had to get home. All right, but you got there eventually. And I this. went back again six months later, yeah. but I did it with a comprehensive team and a very strategic plan. And with that belief to my children that anything is possible, you just have to put in the hard work to make it so. You're the best. Can we see the world record here? You want to see this? Look at this. Look at this. Just, just a subtle little world record from a local girl in Balgala. Well done, Christina. Thank you. Well done. Now, David, obviously in, uh, in surf life saving, it's such a massive part of this area and it doesn't matter where you are, but it is... So, I'm always in awe of people that give up their summer to be able to make sure that somebody else's summer could be even more awesome. What attracts you to doing it all the time? Well, it's fun. Um, basically, you're on the beach. Um, it's what we do, and it's iconically Australian, and in particular, the Northern Beaches. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, over the years, we know from nippers all the way through to, to, to life members, have you seen any change in the number of nippers that want to turn up? Like, so in 2024, it's just as big as it was in the 90s or we, we're um, going to... <clears throat> we had obviously a bit of a dip during COVID, but the numbers are now back to where they were pre-COVID, particularly with the, the youngsters. Um, we haven't quite got there with our um, adult members, but it's improving and um, with a bit of luck, it'll continue to improve. And um, Now, I know what happens numbers. if a person of my uh, fitness attempts what you did. Is there any leeway for the bigger fellas, the, the, the huskier ladies and lads, to be part of the surf life-saving movement? Absolutely. Um, so and I know fat people can ride a bike as well, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you scare me in a great way. You're a lovely and achieving person. I love it. Keep going, sorry. So many people think you need to be an Olympic swimmer to be a surf lifesaver, and you don't. Um, you know, yes, you need to be able to swim, but um, it's not the defining characteristic that you're a, a great swimmer. So... You know, we focus on so many different things. We have board paddlers, we have first aid people, we have um, jet rescue boat drivers, we have jet ski operators. So um, there's, there's a role for everyone. an option Indeed. to both of you. Um, to people who are um, searching for motivation for whatever reason, right, um, they could be, frankly, scared. They could be lonely. Mm. They don't feel like they can take the first step. Um, what do you say to them about how to find motivation when you feel like you don't have it? Yeah. Well, I, it was lovely hearing Madeline speak earlier. She's the best. Yeah, that was, and, and she spoke about the mindset around it. So it's a bit about that. But if you don't have the mindset or the confidence to start, somebody else in your circle might. And so it's, it's that kind of circle of having somebody to believe in you, then you can believe in yourself. Yeah. And the physicality of it, it's... it's it's just second, is what, is what you're saying Absolutely. there, to the belief that anything is possible. Because I love that where, again, just the challenges that we all face within, right, and the people here and people watching at home, and there's, for whatever reason, there's not necessarily a block on trying, but maybe they tried at a different time in mm. their life. Whatever trying is, is involved with, right? I'm talking about volunteering at the school all the way through to the... To the big and bold things. Again, what would you say to those people who, they want to be part of their community, but sometimes... We all, we all started yeah. off as, mm -hmm. as newbies. Um, in Surf Life Saving, the first thing you do is your bronze medallion. Yeah. And, you know, you take your first step, you're in a group of... I've done a it, it's dozen, lovely. ...two dozen people, and mm -hmm. you work through it together, and then you join a patrol, and it, one thing leads to the next. And what's so special about this area? Why is this the part of the world that you want to be in? Well, I think we heard it wonderful from the, the ministers before, how safe it is. My children cycle to school. Um, it's forested. My, it's just it's a really beautiful, friendly place to live. Yeah, it is. You'd agree? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, our beaches are, you know, far and above, you know, most other areas. Freshwater was recently announced the best beach in Australia. So Fantastic. Um, and you agree, obviously. Everyone's all in on this. They're all happy. They're happy. Uh, <laughs> lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Now, let's see me do badly at golf. Enjoy. For 99 years, people have been coming to the Balgala Golf Club, and I thought, because I'm here, it's time to show them a thing or two. Well, Tim's the local club president. Thank you very much for having us here, Mr. President. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Uh, do you get special powers? Uh, are you able to, you know, just uh, make your own score? What happens when you're the president and you're a normal golfer? 
Well, I did sign up thinking it'd be something like that, but unfortunately, it's just a little car park here. <laughs> now, I know golf is an Olympic sport, but I appreciate you got the memo to take the walking out of the experience for me. <laughs> uh, what's your favourite? Uh, what's your favourite hole at this joint? Oh, I love the seventh hole, Paul. Love to show you that one today. All right, well, time to come and show me. Let's uh, <laughs> let's go. Best golfer ever. Recording was that I just kept running and they never said tuck, which is a lovely practical joke from James and the rest of the team. Thank you. All right, now Cincy Atinzano is uh, with the Charity Street Mission, and I wanted to talk to her because we always talk on the show about the cost of living crisis, particularly things um, about people that often get forgotten. Now, look, this is an incredible area, and parts of it are particularly well off, and there are parts of it that battle like everywhere else, and that's what you have to confront um, all the time. Obviously, the past couple of years have been hard. The past year as well, I would imagine, the demand for what you do is up there. Um, for those that aren't doing that well, what's life like in this part of the world? I think it is hard because I think often they're on the fringes and people don't realise that there actually is quite a lot of need in the Northern Beaches. So that's what Street Mission aims to do is to s support those people. And we support them in a number of ways. So often we actually have the, uh, the cafes that operate twice a week and we serve food at the cafes, but we also lend a friendly chat, have a smile, have a tea and coffee with them and give them that support. This is about connection, isn't it? And this exactly. Is, uh, part of what we're enjoying in this segment of the show, which is about community, and community comes in lots of different ways. There are people who are achieving and there are people who just need someone to recognise they're just as valued as everyone else. Exactly. Tell us about the size of the operation in terms of number of volunteers, the amount of things you have to do. So we're actually, we've got around 100 to 150 volunteers. Congratulations. And thank you. Uh, we're very grateful to our volunteers. It's an entirely volunteer-run organisation. Uh, we operate at two cafes and we support about 50 to 30 people twice a week uh, at, on Wednesday nights in DY and on Saturday nights in Bargella. We're just having a look at some of those uh, those photos now. Now, the founder of your uh, incredible charity yes. is here as well. Alan um, Clark. Is who here. are they? And get them to wave at a camera. Hello, yeah. mate. How are you? Thank you very much for starting it. Keep it yeah. going. Tell us a little bit about us. Uh, about yeah, so Alan started the, the organisation back in 1998. Originally, uh, we were supporting people just by raising funds. And then we switched to, in 2001, having the uh, direct services given to the community on the front line. And since then, we've, we've grown to two cafes and stuck to our mission of supporting everyone and we don't uh, discriminate anyone's welcome. And we, yeah, that's Excellent. what we to do. Excellent. All right. So uh, if people want to get in touch, I'd imagine websites, Facebook, Yes, we socials, do have a website. It's all the yeah. same? Yeah, exactly. Streetmission.com is our website and you can donate your time and obviously money as well. So all we're right. grateful for any, any support that we can get. Cincy, lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you. Street Mission. Dot com. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll make sure that we get all of that up on our socials as well. Quick break. Back with more here on Paul Murray Live. <laughs> Thank you to everyone here in Balgala. You've been very kind to us this evening. I very much do appreciate it. Uh, the lovely Bronwyn Bishop, of course, uh, is here. Give her a round as well. We love you, darling. Mum's there as well. Jenny, Wayne, love you all. Glad you're there. All right. Now, um... A bit of breaking news this evening as this just happened, which is the latest news poll. It's currently 51-49 in favour of Labor, but it's coming back to 50-50. The uh, LNP's at 37, Labor Party at 32, Greens at uh, 13 and One Nation at 7. If all of that pushes out, then we're back to a minority government. We'll all wait and talk about that a whole lot more.
tomorrow. Uh, again, thank you, everyone here in Balgala. Thank you to Harvey Norman. Thank you to the team here at Sky News. The Royal Report standing by for a big one. In fact, let's get to it right now. Thank you, Balgala. We'll see you all on the telly tomorrow night. Hello.